low. I'm told that even people in Brazil are watching us live via live streaming, so I can say boa noite. So we are just a very few minutes before starting, and we're also requesting those processing people outside to make it very fast so that we keep on time. You are such a wonderful audience, and the spirit of Steve Biko is in this house. So meantime, we will be soon announcing when our keynote speaker arrives, and uh, we will start with our program. Let me just make the following announcements. I will request your part, I mean your call your cooperation at all times. The first one, the cell phones, that heritage item. It used to be futuristic, but now it's so yesterday. If we can make sure that we put it on silence and we do have Twitter handles here for the Steve Bigo Foundation, which is at Steve at Bigo Foundation. And then we do have the one for UNISA, which is at UNISA. So the reason I didn't say switch it off, your phone, your smartphone, is because I would want this to be trending. But for the phones which are which do not understand <coughs> Twitter, <laughs> WhatsApp. I wouldn't mind if you put it on an airplane mode. <laughs> and if it still is ungovernable, you can remove the battery. <laughs> so. And again, as we wait, I would like to say UNISA this year is celebrating 145 years. And it is 100 years ago that UNISA moved to this city. That's why we have combined our celebrations with those of Mama Sisulu, and Nelson Mandela because the same year we moved to this city. UNISA has almost one million alumni members, which is bigger than some of the small countries. 
just having gone through here. We do have a guest Wi-Fi code that will also be distributed to the media, I think it has been, or it will be, but I'll get an indication. will soon be starting. There is one piece of information what, that we received that Steve Bigo registered with UNISA and the families here. And Steve Bigo's father also was a student here. I think for that, our bond with the Bigo family is quite strong. Whilst Madiba did doidoy at Forte at Vets and so forth, this is about the place that gave him two qualifications degrees. He didn't get it from the other places, uh, but, uh, <coughs> <laughs> but it was because of circumstances. <laughs> we do have a registration of about 350,000 students. And we have writing exam centers around the world. We account for almost one third of South Africa's, uh, you know, graduation rates in many fields. So UNISA is a mega institution. We are the largest in the African continent, largest in the Southern Hemisphere, but one day we met with the Chinese Open University when we thought we were big. <laughs> and they said they only have something like four million. <laughs> I will now ask that we rise as we welcome our guests Thank you, you may be seated. Without any waste of time, as we start the 19th annual Steve Biko Memorial Lecture on this day, the 14th of September, 2018. I think it's proper for us to start with the singing of our national anthem.
Thank you. We may be seated. We may be seated. Uh, I realized that the music was becoming ungovernable. <laughs> but it will catch up with the spirit of the moment. Things do happen. There was one institution as we are about to start in the U.S. where they said I should bring the South African anthem. I brought in a cassette. It was in Cincinnati. But then on the other side, the person fast forwarded, it sang Malaika. <coughs> so, and the program director said, I never knew South African anthem was so beautiful. <laughs> it was difficult to retrieve that congratulation. So without any waste of time, before we settle down, let's call upon our vice chancellor and principal so that he can extend a welcome to all of us, then we can feel free to engage and go into the lecture. And I've looked around and I don't envy the VC acknowledging so many leaders per square meter. I looked around and I realized that from the young to the old, the student leaders, the government leaders, the business leaders, the diplomats are here. But uh, we also have people watching us and following the event from King Williamstown, Ginsberg, in Brazil, abroad, and several other countries. Of course, Nati normally remembers each and every one of them. So I'll wait for his signal. So let's call upon and put our hands together for our Vice Chancellor. Dr. Figeni, our program director, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. His Excellency President Cyril Madamela Ramaphosa, President of the Republic of South Africa, Minister Naledi Pando, Minister of Higher Education and Training, Kosi Patagile Holomisa, Deputy Minister of Labor, Mr. Andres Snell, Deputy Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Ms. Tembi Majola, Deputy Minister of Energy, Mr. Munli Kungubele, Deputy Minister of Finance, Mr. Trevor Manuel, Chairman of All Mutual Limited and former Minister of Finance, and Mrs. Maria Ramos, Mr. Saki Similane, the chairman of the UNESA Council, uh, Mrs. Similane and all the members of UNESA Council who are present here tonight, Mrs. Mandu Makanya, Mrs. Nonsigalelo Bigo, Mr. Nkosinati Bigo, the founder and executive trustee of the Steve Bigo Foundation, and Mrs. Bigo and other members of the Bigo family present. Your Excellency Ambassador Bene Mpoko, Ambassador of the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps to South Africa. Your Excellencies, Ambassadors and High Commissioners present. Your Majesties, Nkosi Zanelizwe Dalinjevo, Nkosi Tanti Sikau, Nkosi Atlangene Sikau, Nkosi Mzikotolo Chali, Princess Mandlagazi Sikau, Nkosana Patrick Nzobi, Mr. Ismail Nkabela, the chairman of the Steve Bigo Foundation and other members of the foundation present, but also Mrs. Nkabela, Dr. Brigalia Bam, chairman of the Tabumbegi Foundation and other members of the Tabumbegi Foundation present, members of the UNESCO Executive and Extended Management, 
the former UNISA office bearers, starting with Judge Bernard Mwepe and Mrs. Stephanie Mwepe. Judge Mwepe is the former chancellor of UNISA, but also the former judge president of the North and South Gauteng High Courts. And I want to greet all the members of the judiciary who are with us here tonight. Professor Bani Nyamego Pichana, the former principal and vice chancellor of UNISA, and Mrs. Dimza Pichana. Representatives from national, provincial, local, government, as well as chapter nine institutions present. Representatives from various educational institutions, organizations, and foundations present. Members of the ecclesiastical community, representatives from various political parties in attendance, members of the business community, members of the university community, representatives from various student bodies present, leaders of our national SRC and all the SRCs from our sister universities, leaders of organized labor at UNISA and our country, representatives from various media houses present, distinguished members of the audience, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Tumelang Bakais. Abshain. Nda. Rialucha. Huyanand. Molueni. Bonsoir. I've got you there. <laughs> On behalf of the University of South Africa and our partner, the Steve Bigo Foundation, I'm pleased to welcome all of you to this historic 19th Bigo Annual Memorial Lecture this evening. We embrace you all in the spirit of Ubuntu. Each time we hold these flagship memorial lectures, the country and the world take notice and participate in one form or another in remembering this iconic intellectual and liberation struggle icon, the giant, the tower, Steve Bantubiko. This tells us that he belonged to his family, he belonged to his community, he belonged to his organization, he belonged to us all. A resounding testimony, if ever we needed such, that his legacy remains timely and timeless. Steve Bigo was one of the central figures in the struggle against the apartheid regime. His greatness is attested to by the fact that more than four decades after his murder, his voice still reverberates from generation to generation, informing conversations and debates in our country, our continent, and the global community. So you will find when I say that it is an honor for me to thank the Bigo family, the Steve Bigo Foundation, for the partnership that has seen this flagship memorial lecture growing from strength to strength. UNISA is pleased to play our part in its growth and the promotion of Bigo's black consciousness ideology and ethos to all corners of our society through community outreach. Well, our apologies there, just a problem with our feed, but we will take you back to that uh, Steve Biko Memorial Lecture shortly. And remember, President Cyril Ramaphosa will be delivering the 19th annual Steve Biko Memorial Lecture. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll continue with the show. And if our feed is back up, we'll take you right back to UNISA. Where am I going to sleep now? What about my kids? There is pride involved. 
because we are not aware that they will come today. People are being evicted about two months ago in May. our liberation and democracy. The common theme and voices from our universities, our cities, our villages, our townships, our farms, our informal settlements, is that we cannot underrate social justice and overrate reconciliation. That, in fact, the two go together. Ariel Dorfman delivered the Nelson Mandela lecture in 2010 and captured the essence of our quest for social justice when he said, and I quote, we cannot undo the damage of the past, but we must strive instead to undo the damage to the future. We must prove in our actions tomorrow that we learned from the terrors and the sins of yesteryear. As we continue on our task of nation building, we should be reminded of the timeless relevance of Steve Biko's black consciousness ideology, which recognized the redemptive, humanizing, and empowering value of human consciousness as the most potent tool in galvanizing society towards nation building by pricking our sense of agency as authors of our destiny and captains of our journey to that destiny. Your Excellency President Ramaphosa, we are the helm of our republic, and we are all working with you as you chaperone all of us along the path that we shall be taking to confront and overcome these challenges. It is therefore more appropriate, especially this evening, simply because of your own role and being part of the black consciousness, which was part and parcel of your own political heritage, in the early years of your political activism that you are going to be speaking to us here tonight. Having said that, I also just want to make a confession that with my eyes that are moving around, I've actually picked up Mrs. Zanelle Mbegi, the former first lady of our republic, and I'm greeting her formally. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all invited here tonight to enjoy ourselves because we are going to be hearing from the President of the Republic communicating to us on a journey of reflection on this 19th Steve Beagle Memorial Lecture. 
I can guarantee you that this is going to be the festival of ideas and engagements to flourish. And we are hoping that they will not only flourish in the ZK Matthews Great Hall, not only with those that we are connected to who are receiving this lecture directly, but also to those that may not necessarily be having access in a direct sense of the word, that we have a responsibility of ensuring that this message reaches every human being from wherever they are, because this is the only way in which we can build the future that we all want. With these few words, I just want to say you are most welcome. If you are welcome to this university, take it as your university. It is, by the way, the University of South Africa. My students always say, Vice Chancellor, remember, it's the University of the Land. So with those few words, you are most welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, VC. Let's put our hands again together for the VC. As we were marking the 145 years, I wondered sitting whether what would happen if those who were there when it was still University of Good Hope were to wake up and they ask for direction, then they say, oh, our tambo building for admin. When they turn for music, they say, Miriam Makeba. They come to this hall, they say, ZK Matthews. They go to the other building, they say, Robert Sobukwe building. Then they go to the other one, Steve Bigo building. Such is diversity at UNISA. We live it, we embrace it. Such is diversity in Oxondonga somewhere. Now, I'm going to call upon a person who is a torchbearer, who has kept the flame of the Biko legacy and foundation in particular banning with his quiet and yet determined energy. And our partnership, as the VC was saying, with the Steve Bigo Foundation is one of the best. Let's put our hands together for that. It is a gift that keeps on giving. Now I call upon Nkosnati Biko. Let's put our hands together for Nkosnati. Thank you, uh, Program Director. Uh, Comrade President, I do not think that I can do a better job with the pleasantries than the Vice, uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, allow me to simply say in comrade language, uh, seconded, uh, Vice Chancellor. <laughs> I am, however, a product of two constituencies, um, and one of them is a constituency called Towers. And so I'd like to recognize the political leadership present here, particularly uh, those organizations that have embraced Steve Biko consistently for many, many years. I have also met with the leadership of the Fees Must Fall, who asked me, Mr. President, to whisper to you, which I hereby do, <laughs> that in your entry is a very important piece of correspondence regarding the matter of their comrades who are in jail. They said to say that <clears throat> They said to say that as a former detainee yourself, you will be familiar with the contents of the motivation. <laughs> Thank you. 
The 12th of September marked the 41st commemoration of the murder of Comrade Bantu Steve Biko. As usual, we received numerous messages from home, across the continent and the diaspora, and from many progressive forces around the world. I believe that we are represented here by our own political leadership, but they are also representatives of 25 governments that are present with us today, so we are most welcome. We thank each and every one of the originators of these messages, and we also thank the many people who held commemorative events around the country, who created artistic productions, who wrote opinion pieces, who tweeted, called in to radio stations, and who altered their online profiles in salutation. I must also confess that I received a, a few uh, please call me's. <clears throat> <laughs> now, those are also appreciated. <laughs> it would appear, uh, Comrade President, that even when the rent is low, there is still sufficient social capital, and we welcome those messages. Had Steve Biko lived, he would be 72 years today. The average age of his colleagues who are here in numbers is 70. This is a generation that understood its role, they seized the baton, and they sprinted the nation towards democracy. And we salute those that are present here. One of the messages I received was from Tulani Kanyile, who had this to say. With each passing year, I am forever grateful for the leadership and gift and the example of your old man and his fellow travelers in our country and across the diaspora. They bequeathed unto us an independence, a pride of in, in our heritage, and belief in our innate ability as a people." End quote. Regrettably, we have lost many of these comrades. And as I speak, at least I know of at least three of them who are in prison, uh, excuse me, who are in hospital. And we wish them a speedy recovery. We are, however, comforted in the knowledge that a number of them still have uh, uh, some spring in them. And they will soon express themselves on the dance floor, Goomba style, if you give them a chance. <laughs> I do suspect that uh, their SOL moves or would visit great violence on those knees these days. <clears throat> now, it's not so much the dying of the dance, I think, that we must bemoan. It's the uh, fading of memories. I think it's the abundance of ignorance that we are seeing. And I visited a government department a few months ago and witnessed how veterans were being treated uh, who had gone to process the, some of their social benefits. Many of these heroes and sheroes of our struggle have not ever shared their suffering, let alone their contribution to freedom and democracy. They have not ever solicited undue benefits. They have no statue dedicated to their honor. They have no street, no bridge, no school, no community hall named or dedicated to them. And they have become blurred images in their communities and in their families. And many will never, ever write a book. When the movie maker Steven Spielberg produced the movie Schindler's List, he took some of the proceeds and he conducted an international oral history project and has gone on to record 50,000 survivors of the Holocaust experience. And this project has provided the most valuable archival database to young scholars and historians. And I implore you, Mr. President, that it is in order to consider investing some of our own national resources towards a similar project for our own history in South Africa. And it would seem to me that we cannot delink the why question from the what question. The question what, which speaks to the things that must be done, seems to have challenges because we haven't dealt with the why, the question of the moral obligation to do the things that we need to do. And we watched in amazement earlier this month when we had to chastise a foreign leader who inserted himself in local politics 
a person, by the way, regarded by his own people as a person needing rescuing from his own worst impulses. <laughs> we watched in astonishment as parliamentarians dealt with an offensive ahistorical narrative on the land question, as we saw some of the presentations there. And we were reminded by Eusebius Makaiser and Sizu and Bofu Welsh, the two young South Africans with beautiful minds, that our commitment to freedom of expression does not create an obligation to extend gratuitous, disproportionate airtime to these voices. The Steve Eco Foundation was established in 2017. It uses history and heritage as a basis for promoting citizen agency. And one way we have elected to celebrate this year is to bring together the 70s generation in King Williamstown in the second week of December. There are three objectives. The first is to conduct dialogue. The second is to conduct the first lot of oral history interviews with a special focus on those who are seniors, and there are many of them who are already in the age group of about 80 or so. And the last purpose is to Goomba. So I'm going to ask you to please spread the word. And as you go back home, look at your kids, your archives, your family albums, and see how it is that we can organize ourselves towards this project. I'm also going to ask you to bring your best set of needs for the day. Next uh, Monday, the foundation turns 20. And I wanted to commend the young men and women who have kept it going for the many years. I want to also thank the board, Mr. Mkabela, my chair, Mr. Miller Arnold, Professor Hwapa, and Mrs. Biko, who have climbed many a hill together, but who remain invigorated. I would like to pay a special tribute to Mrs. Biko. As we gather here, elsewhere in the country, in the town of Robert Sobukwe in Kimberley, the National Heritage Council has a different event at which they are honoring her. She is a recipient of the Ubuntu Award for the year 2018. I will not bother you with a citation, but it's important, people, just to remark that if my mother is getting an Ubuntu Award, then it is well deserved. I have an uncle, he is now late, Dr. Mashalaba was his name, who when my father sent a group of negotiators to negotiate for a hand in marriage, was rather disturbed by my father's shabby shoes. Uh, he was a snobbish fellow. And little did he know though that those shoes would carry my parents not only beyond the threshold but on a journey of infinite miles. And he would introduce her on this journey as my woman, the ultimate embodiment of black is beautiful. So we have witnessed you, Mandlovu, honoring uh, him for many, many years. We continue to witness the work that you do and your embrace and support that you give to young people, which is indeed the reason that you are being celebrated in Kimberley. A few weeks ago, you were in Hrafreinet to also honor Mrs. Sobukwe. And Mrs. Sobukwe herself was a worthy recipient of the Order of Lutuli in silver, in recognition of her role in the fight against apartheid and the steadfast support of political prisoners. We must thank the Black House Collective, a group of young people from Soweto, who submitted a just-in-time motivation to allow us to celebrate Mrs. Sobukwe during her lifetime. For many years, the nation has decried the absence of the PAC and the legacy of Robert Sobukwe from the place of honor in South Africa, as it has Azapo, Steve Biko, and many others. Now, when an outstanding player in a professional team is selected to play in the national squad,
he or she carries the national flag as much as the aspirations of the club. And however much this may frustrate the club and its own plans. Now, Comrade President, you did very well in honoring Mrs. Sobukwe with a state funeral. She is a national asset. It was the correct thing to do. I suspect, though, that there are some lessons to be learned towards finding the sweet balance between country and club, between nation and uh, party. And perhaps Mrs. Sobukwe's last gift to us is this challenge of finding our way around this question, reflecting on the place of honor, the time for honor, and the ways of honor. Comrade President, you yourself were recently selected into the national team as captain of Team South Africa. <laughs> we are reminded by Litia Pemaisela that your selection by your club on the 18th of December, which coincides with Steve Biko's birthday, was a birthday gift. And you will be familiar with the sense of anticipation that precedes the unwrapping of a birthday gift. Those of us who grew up in the days of Lucky Packet know this. It stands to bring you great joy, Mr. President. But there is always the hope, there is always the faint possibility that it might disappoint. In the build-up to your selection, your club ran a gruesome internal selection process. And for the first time within the ruling party, the two primary contenders were both Baptists of the waters of black consciousness. You have been assigned to lead, and we have asked you to share with us your perspective of what, if anything, from these historic roots provides us with answers to the challenges in your entry. Lastly, around 1974, the conversation on the economic thrust of the black consciousness movement began to coagulate around the concept of communalism. At the center of communalism is the impulse of a shared prosperity built out of individual productivity. If a member of a community is less productive, those of greater means extend such means in order to lift them to a better place and for the greater good. A prosperous neighbor would lend a needy neighbor a cow in order for the family to sustain itself which car would be recalled at the discretion of the owner. Because the concept of well-being relates to self as it does to other, this allows for a community to answer to the inquiry of their well-being in the plural narrative, siapila, we are all well. This arrangement gives rise to the expression, ingo mengoma in You milk the lone cow with the occasional peep over your shoulder. As an avid cattle farmer, Mr. President, <laughs> you will know that a cow yields best when it feeds best. Yes, yes. A wise, needy neighbor will be concerned with more than just today's meal. He will head the cow to green pastures in order to safeguard the future meals. Most importantly, he will breed the cow such that it is its offspring improve the resilience of his community and that his debt is soon settled and the favor extended. Every five years, political parties become the needy neighbor. They seek a mandate from the citizens. We are approaching such a window in the not so distant future. We have been here before and we have lost many a cow. We anticipate that this time, the gift box contains a gift of wise leadership. We anticipate that the various clubs will avail the best the league has to offer towards the formation of a national team. We anticipate that the national captain will fly the national flag. We anticipate that the benevolent community members, the voters, 
will come to evaluate the well-being of the lone cow and exercise their discretion wisely. We anticipate that the neighbor will have learned much from milking the cow dry. He will have seen the wisdom of letting it multiply. We owe this well-being to Mandela, Sobukwe, and Biko. But most importantly, we owe this to the unknown soldier whose only dividend is the dignity of our people. Thank you. Wow. I'm sure others would say that's deep. <laughs> the metaphors, the idioms, the proverbs. Kosnati is a leader in his own right. And a tribute to the mother. Ikamala Makoskazi. Ikamala Makoskazi. Siabule Lamantov. As now we move towards Uvutondaba, the apex. Some of you might have noticed me moving from that side to that side. They said I was on the way of cameras. <coughs> <laughs> I've always been warning camera people, all those who come to see me, they produce the paper, they say a white balance, and I ask them, when are we going to have the black balance? Because <laughs> this is the problem. <laughs> Said your sector won't transform as long as you are always trying the white balance. Without any waste of time, I'll now invite our vice chancellor, once more to present to us our keynote speaker, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Makanya. Let's put our hands together for him. No, thank you so much, uh, uh, Program Director. Um, I'm expected to introduce um, our president, and I've been saying to him, uh, do you introduce the president uh, in, in, in this country? Or do you simply say, this is the president who is the product of this country, uh, the product of ordinary men and women that uh, you find everywhere in the corners of this country, uh, that he is a product of our own schooling system that we have all gone through, so which means that he is one of us, and like us. But the main thing that I just want to share with you is that uh, President Cyril Matamela Ramaphosa studied with this great university, UNISA. <laughs> so that anything that we can forget, we must remember that he obtained his BPROC degree at the University of South Africa, hence his role of becoming a lawyer and how he transitioned from that position of being a lawyer into the trade union movement, which he led so outstandingly. And thereafter, his role in our liberation movements as we've had, but also in the current African National Congress and the manner in which he has conducted himself over the years, which continues to be a pride of this country. This is what we always aspire to, that we want leaders who lead so that those of us can follow and accompany him in that journey that takes us to that promised land. Mr. President, it is now my honor to invite you to come and share with us what we have in store for us. And we are looking at that with so much excitement. Thank you so much, President. 
kila kwa ma Afrika ungakalo mkhaki kusila madoda ingabaga mlimbongi kuzotheti ngangalala ungavikwe tshele dipaka ama ramaposa uboyazi ndio bikasha lifikila adibizwa ndingezi aditunywa ndingayi tuma mina mongameni Inkosi must stand this kaka sivumile abantu bakuthi Mr President the chosen one Mandela's choice for president the negotiator a graduate of this university a true definition of what's meant to be yours will always be yours cereal the most important meal of the day no conflicts Isn't was mtaka ngika ikatile lenziko imisebenzi dololo ukuze siphumelele kufuneka simanyane kufuneka sibengumntomnye kufuneka sibophi bhanti kufuneka sisindi ngokholoza xale bhafalo zeni kumbule sizwe ikawitiwile ile mjansane Masifundelo lwazi kubantu Steve Biko masibe sisizwe sikolayo mabaqolelo bafundi befizi masoli sizwe yona ntwa disidi kakuna mkhaja mongameli uchaba lixesha abajene pakama ramaposi xesha lifikile pakama ramaposi xesha lifikile Long live the spirit of black consciousness. Long live. Long live. Ivan was a chauvin in a stand in the bar. There come yo. Thank you, comrades. <laughs> Program director, Dr. Somato Tafigeni, members of the Biko family, Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of South Africa, Professor Mandla Makanya.
trustees of the Steve Biko Foundation, ministers and deputy ministers, members of the judiciary, Usiz Zanele Mbeki, Professor Bani Pichana, the former vice chancellor of this institution, student leaders, labor leaders, your majesties, your excellencies, ambassadors, and high commissioners, and leaders of various political parties that are represented here. And ladies and gentlemen, I am greatly indebted to the Biko family, the Steve Biko Foundation, and the University of South Africa for allowing me the honor to deliver the 19th annual Biko Memorial Lecture. I have a few confessions to make before or as I speak. Steve Biko, as uh, president of the South African Student Organization, was my leader as I was the chair of the Teflo branch of SASO. So it is an honor to deliver this lecture in his memory today. I never got to meet Steve Biko, but I had lived in the hope that as a branch chairperson of his organization at the University of the North, that I would meet him when he comes visiting our branch. I'm sad that it never happened. He and other leaders of SASO decided on a campaign to have us celebrate the victory of Relimo in Mozambique in 1974. Well, their decision got me arrested for organizing the pro Relimo rally. So I have a bone to pick with Steve Pico. When I meet him, I will pick this bone with him that he got me arrested and finally expelled from my university before I could get my degree. Hence, I finally had to come to UNISA. But the other important thing is that it is a real honor to deliver this lecture at UNISA, my alma mater. It is good to have this lecture also during the year when we celebrate the centenary of Nelson Mandela and Umama U Albertina Sisulu. Madiba had huge respect for Steve Biko and in our discussions, he often spoke very fondly of Steve Biko and mourned his untimely departure from our land. Earlier this week, we commemorated the 41st anniversary of the death of and detention of Steve Biko. In its fear and desperation, in his brutality and callous disregard for life, the apartheid state inflicted a devastating loss on the Biko family and on our nation. The murder of Steve Biko reverberated across the world, reinforcing the characterization of apartheid as a crime against humanity. In the week that we commemorate a cruel death, we also honor and celebrate a truly remarkable life, a life that was cut too short, too young, 
It was a life dedicated to the pursuit of freedom, of equality, justice, and truth. It was the life of a great but humble revolutionary who fiercely rejected the false hierarchy of races. He spoke with the burning eloquence of the essential humanity of all people. He understood that the system of apartheid was predicated on the delicate lie of white supremacy and black inferiority. He knew too that this lie was perpetuated by those who sought to preserve white economic privilege at the direct expense and to the exclusion of the black majority. The philosophy of Steve Biko was fundamentally the antithesis of this lie. It was about establishing the principles on which a new and more humane society would be established in our country. He made this very clear when he said, we have set out on a quest for true humanity, and somewhere in the distant horizon, we can see the glittering prize. Let us march forth with courage and determination, drawing strength from our common plight and our brotherhood. In time, he continued, we shall be in a position to bestow upon South Africa the greatest possible gift, a more humane face, close quotes. But where did this all come from? We can ask ourselves. Ian McQueen writes in his book, Black Consciousness and the Progressive Movements Under Apartheid. And he writes that black consciousness movement was a protean movement, the product of its time. The movement drew from diverse trajectories of the ideas molded to fit a purpose, to resuscitate black pride and to generate a renewed project of political empowerment. Black consciousness emphasizes the way of life which those oppressed by apartheid should adopt to embody a liberated mind, close quotes. What Steve Biko sought to articulate was really the lived experience of black people and to restore the hum true humanity of all people, black and white, and to build a society in which there would be no majority nor minority. There would just be people, free, fulfilled, and at peace. It is that quest for a true humanity that must lie at the core of our every endeavor. For decades, this quest has been a constant companion to the struggles of our people for freedom, dignity, and respect. It was present at the formation of liberation movements during the campaigns of defiance, during the strikes and stayaways and armed resistance that our people embarked upon. It is found within seminal documents like the African Claims, the Freedom Charter, in the writings of Pixley Kaisa Kaseme, Sol Pleike, Alex Laguma, Bessie Head, Steve Biko, and many others. 
Now, in another time, under different circumstances, as we confront new and sometimes unexpected challenges, we are driven by this goal. To succeed, we must start, as Steve Biko did, with affirming our own sense of self. Biko told, taught us, as the revolutionary value, rather sorry, Biko taught us the revolutionary value of the confidence of black people in their own humanity and identity. He spoke of the debilitating effect of centuries of colonialism and oppression on the psyche of black people, making them complicit in perpetuating a sense of inferiority. His answer, black consciousness, was for the black person to see themselves as being complete in themselves. It was a philosophy that embraced the confidence as well as the optimism of the African-American poet and social activist Langston Hughes, who wrote, I quote, I, to sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and I eat well and I grow strong. Tomorrow I will be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen. Then, besides, they will see how beautiful I am and be ashamed because I too am America." Close quotes. Now, Langston Hughes, Steve Biko, or like Langston Hughes, Steve Biko sought to lead his people to claim their rightful place at the table of humanity, not under the table, not next to the table, not by the table, but at the table of humanity. That's what Steve Biko wanted us to have. While some regard black consciousness as a historical artifact, the ideas that Steve pronounced are timeless and universal. They are no less powerful and no less relevant today, precisely also in our own country. Even as we have defeated apartheid, even as we have built a democratic state, the psychological and physical vestiges of institutionalized racism still persist to this day. Even today, we observe in ways both subtle and crude the residue of some amongst our white compatriots who have a sense of entitlement and a dose of arrogance. But in some circles, we also observe black submission. Thanks to the advent of social media, the prejudice that lurks below the surface is, from time to time, given virulent expression. It is a measure of the progress we have made and the impact of leaders like Steve Biko, Oliver Tambo, and many others that society acts with revulsion to racist outbursts that seem to occur in the country from time to time. While naked racism is an aberration, the material manifestation of racism, white wealth and black poverty is the norm. It is our responsibility, therefore, 
to both confront deeply embedded feelings of inferiority that manifest in submission and also deal with the superiority that is expressed in supremacy. This should then enable us to work to overcome the economic and social inequality that underpins them. This is not confined to race. Throughout history, there are few relationships more unequal than those between men and women. Women bear the brunt of centuries of discrimination and oppression. Discrimination and oppression that is imposed, in this case, not by a colonial power, but by the traditions, practices, and institutions of the society in which they were born. The struggle against patriarchy is therefore a struggle against the social norms, the attitudes and the thoughts that embolden men and enfeeble women. As black consciousness is a necessary part of the response to racism, so too is the self-affirmation of women necessary for the achievement of gender equality in our country as well. The assertion by women of their own power and their own agency is the foundation on which we must work together to eradicate all forms of manifestations of patriarchy. It is a necessary condition for the improvement of the economic status of women and the achievement of real equality in all areas of life. Our quest for a true humanity requires that we should address the inequality between men and women and bring it to an end in our country, in our lifetime as well. Our continued quest also for a true humanity requires that we end poverty. No society can be free for as long as any member is denied the basic requirements of life, food, shelter, water, security, and work. When poverty is so widespread, when it is so deeply embedded in the structure of society, when it has existed for so long, as any of us can remember, then there is a real danger that we learn to live with it, we learn to accept it, and we find it acceptable and regard it as part and parcel of our existence. We should not and cannot accept that poverty is an inevitable feature of our human condition. We must refuse to do so. Because the face of poverty in South Africa is that of an African woman, our task is to address the racial and gender dimensions of this economic exclusion. This means, in the first instance, that we must educate the black child and the girl child. If we are to end the transmission of poverty and accept it being intergenerational, moving from one generation to the next generation, we must ensure that every child receives from their earliest years until adulthood comprehensive quality education. <laughs> this is the reason why we have invested so extensively in early childhood development and why we have made 
higher education free to the children of the poor and the working class. It is for this reason, too, that we continue to give attention to the physical state of our schools, the availability of resources, and the quality of learning, teaching, and leadership. But despite the progress that we have made over the last two decades, inequality in education remains one of the greatest obstacles to the achievement of a just and prosperous future and to the achievement of this basic humanity that Steve Biko so sought to struggle for. The fault lines of race, gender, class, and geography are nowhere more distinct than in access to a decent education. Unless we correct this as a matter of priority, we will not reduce inequality and we will not end poverty in our country. This requires a shift in social mindset, where few things are valued more than knowledge and learning, where parents, relatives, friends, and neighbors take a keen interest in the development of the young mind. It requires teachers, principals, administrators, elected representatives, and political formations who place at the center of their efforts the promotion of educational excellence. We must be a society where the burning of a school, the trashing of a library, is a great affront to our sense of moral purpose. <laughs> our quest for true humanity must be rooted in a genuine sense of solidarity. For the last three centuries, the history of our country has been defined by deprivation of the many to enable the enrichment of the few. Today, our people continue to live that history. The shadow of that history continues to dog our people on a continuous basis. Millions live without work, without land, without security, without opportunity. And yet our Constitution, which is readily embraced by all South Africans, enjoins us not only to recognize the injustices of the past, but also to ensure equitable redress of historical inequity. Since the advent of democracy, we have progressively directed resources towards meeting the needs of the poor, providing assets in the form of land and houses, equalizing spending on education, health and social grants, and investing in infrastructure in previously neglected areas. We have ne enacted legislation and implemented policies to improve the representation of black people, women, and the disabled in the economy to encourage the development of black and women entrepreneurs and to increase black ownership of the economy. These efforts have met with some success, not full or total success, but have not done nearly enough to reduce inequality or overcome exclusion. We are therefore called upon to embark on an extensive program of fundamental redistribution that will close the gap between those who have and those who do not have, between white and black, and between men and women, and between rural and urban as well. It requires the involvement of all within our society with those who have most
been prepared to make the greatest contribution. It requires a recognition by those who are the beneficiaries of decades of racial privilege that they have both a responsibility and a vested interest in ending privilege and effecting redress. This has to be a national task, and it is pivoted around a value that Steve Biko promoted so well, solidarity. And it is in this regard that we call upon our compatriots, those who have become so well endowed to reach out to those who are still right at the bottom. And this is a moment that this country should come together, whether we're talking about land, whether we're talking about opportunity, this is the moment that is called for people to act in solidarity. Inequality severely constrains our ability as a country to realize our potential. It limits our growth, perpetuates hardship, and promotes instability. We must therefore become a society that is defined by solidarity, not by competition. We must become a society that is defined by compassion and not by selfishness. We must build a society that is defined by generosity. Those who have followed the history of the black consciousness movement closely will remember that the black consciousness movement was deeply rooted in encouraging those amongst black people who had become better off to demonstrate their compassion by getting involved in community work. Unlike its characterization as a movement of predominantly intellectuals, the black consciousness activists had a strong ethos of community involvement and students were encouraged to plow back their skills and their knowledge into their local communities. A practical expression of this was how the Black Consciousness Movement went around setting up a number of community-based facilities, be they clinics and a number of them, in the deep rural areas of our country to empower our people. Dr. Mampele Rampele was at the cutting edge of this development as she, as a doctor, set up a clinic in one of the deepest rural areas to serve our people as a medical graduate. And this has to be applauded. And one wishes that that ethos could come back. One wishes that that ethos of giving back could come back, particularly among the young people of our country. That once they have been endowed with an education, and those amongst us who have become endowed with progress and who have succeeded in our lives should be filled with a sense of generosity and be able to plow back and to give back. Today, as we celebrate Steve Biko's life, this for me has come back very prominently to memory, that this is what Steve Biko was also very much about, what many people do not realize. We must give effect to the expression from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. Our quest for a true humanity requires that we have leaders of integrity, 
and a society that values honesty and hard work. As we emerge from the corruption of apartheid, we are called upon to forge a new morality which places the interests of the people above the narrow interests of the individual, which places the interests of the people as a whole above the narrow and selfish interests of individual leaders. Now, in the 25th year of our democracy, we must acknowledge with shame and regret that we have failed to live up to the standards of the selfless leaders that came before us. We now know of powerful individuals who use positions of authority to plunder the resources of the people threatening our economic sustainability and further empower, impoverishing our people. We now know of business leaders, of people, whose reckless and fraudulent actions eroded the savings of many ordinary people as well. Astounded as we are by the devastating audacity of one family and their associates, we should not be blinded to the corruption that has taken hold in many institutions across government. But this also applies across the corporate sector. This requires firm, decisive, and united action. We have begun the work, but there is still much more to be done. Commissions of inquiry, disciplinary hearings, criminal prosecutions, and lengthy prison sentences are necessary instruments to tackle the scourge. But ultimately, we will not succeed unless we forge a new morality. We need leaders who serve with diligence and commitment, seeking neither advantage nor undue rewards for themselves. Every citizen needs to respect the rights and property of others respect the law, and know that you will also be respected by the law. We must rise above the differences of color, faith, creed, and affiliation to pursue a common mission. The non-racial character of our nation must gain resurgence. We must see ourselves as a nation being consolidated. We must draw on the example of Steve Biko, who belonged to a special generation of young and fearless patriots who kept the flames of liberation burning. He and leaders like Professor Harry Nengwekuru, who is here, and Reverend Barney Pichana, bequeathed to us as a nation a cohort of leaders as the original leaders of the Black Consciousness Movement. They bequeathed to us, to our nation, a cohort of leaders who were politicized in the South African Students' Organization and sharpened their revolutionary skills in struggle. The Black Consciousness Movement gave rise to an enduring consciousness amongst oppressed South Africans who found political homes in different organizations, but shared a common commitment to end a crime against humanity that apartheid was. <laughs> Bantu Steve Biko led people, not parties. His revolution
and his revolution was that of the mind, not one of membership. The alumni of his movement, and I'm one of them, are spread right across many formations and are found in many parts of society and different geographies. Steve Biko was a selfless revolutionary whose epoch-defining ideas contributed significantly in making South Africa what it is today. His thoughts continue to guide us in our quest for a true humanity. And it is this humanity that we must find. And it is this moral campus that we must find if we are indeed to accede to the level that Steve Biko wanted us to accede to. This is the time for us to march forth, as Steve Biko called on us to do. With courage and with determination to bestow upon South Africa the greatest gift possible, a South Africa with a human face, a South Africa that has embraced humanity, a South Africa where all of us feel that we are regaining our humanity as a nation and as a people. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that was, of course, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa delivering the keynote address there at uh, the 19th annual Steve Biko Memorial Lecture uh, taking place at UNISA. And he talks about, of course, Steve Biko's uh, values and what he stood for and how those were timeless. Also talking about us basically as a nation getting back to basics, talking about how black women are actually the face of poverty and how we need to really... Uh, deal with patriarchy and uh, try and claw back uh, some of uh, the losses that we've made in terms of how we've behaved as a society and uh, he also touched on our morality as a South African society and how we need to reclaim the moral high ground in this regard. So we're going to take a break and when we come back more news here on The Full View. Need to know more about the markets? This is where it all starts, at the SAPC's headquarters in Oakland Park in Johannesburg, South Africa. We analyze, report, crunch the numbers, call in the experts, package the news, and bring you critical global market updates from the JSE. The continent's leaders in liquid market movement and the fastest growing secondary listings made right here. Small businesses, the backbone of the economy, with South Africa's very high unemployment rate, it said that 90% of new jobs could come from this sector. Every weekday afternoon on DSTV Channel 404.
Well, good evening and welcome to The Full View. I'm Sakina Kamwendo and it's been a very busy news week. And here on Full View, we will shortly uh, be uh, taking you through some of the lead stories as well. And uh, just an apology, we were meant to speak to Al Imad Foundation. Uh, we did tweet that, but unfortunately, as you could see, uh, the lecture overrunning slightly from what we had anticipated. But many of you also asking about uh, former President Thabo Mbeki because uh, we understand Understand he might be speaking so we're keeping an eye on those developments and if and when he does we certainly will return to UNISA to bring you that live as well well alarmingly um, we've seen an increase in gun related violence and also stabbing incidences in our schools and that's led us to our question of the day this evening where we asked you uh, do you believe that we should be installing metal detectors at schools given some of the incidents that have taken place at various schools across the country and uh, we ask you to send us your views on this so let's take a listen to some of your comments all right uh, we certainly will uh, take a look at that uh, at a later stage if we can unfortunately can't bring them up right now but let's get into some of those stories making headlines this evening now former parktown boys a water polo coach has been found guilty of 104 charges of sexual assault and 12 charges of assault now colin rex initially faced over 300 charges relating to rape sexual grooming and attempted murder. Judge Pete Johnson delivered his judgment at the South Gauteng High Court sitting in Palm Ridge. While delivering judgment, Judge Johnson stated that Rex had proved to be an open and credible witness that accepted responsibility for his actions. He further stated that Rex had answered